pray as he speaks this morning that um, the words he speaks will be your words and not his. And Father, that we would all hear and take on board what we need to this morning, that we would actually um, choose to respond to your word being spoken this morning. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Thank you very much for that word of prophecy. I feel so blessed because the Lord has spoken. And that is um, exactly what he wants me to bring to the congregation today. It's not the best of weathers. But I believe that our joy does not depend on the weather. This is the day that the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad. It's such a wonderful privilege to be before you this morning. I felt so honored to bring the word to you. But there is one thing I would like you to understand. I may not be as patient as Martin. I may not even be as funny as Lee. I may not be as articulate as Brother Greg. But one thing I can be, it's me. And I'm trying to be, I'm going to be me today. Do I feel sorry about it or apologetic? No, not really. But Brother Lowe, it comes across as if you don't even care, as if you're arrogant. Hold it right there, my brother. Hold it right there, my sister. The Bible says in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, the word of God says, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in your weakness. I rather you boast in your infirmities that the power of Jesus Christ may rest upon you. Because I'm weak, I'm confident that the tabernacle of Christ, the, the power of Christ will tabernacle upon me. I have not come to you today in my own power. I've come to you in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us just begin to welcome his presence. Without him, this will be a social gathering. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit. More than ever before, I welcome you this morning. And I acknowledge that you are not a fool, but a friend. You are not a power but a person. So I invite your divine presence to comfort and to counsel us, to intercede and to advocate for us, to help, to strengthen, and to stand by us as we draw even closer to the Father and to the Son. Come, Spirit, of the Most High God, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Shine your light, for in your light 
we shall see light. The entrance of your word gives light and it gives understanding to the simple. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our Redeemer, forever, O oh Lord, your word is settled in heaven. May your word be settled in your church today. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. Today, I will be talking about the eternal purpose of God. The eternal purpose of God. Why is it important for us to know the eternal purpose of God? It is because origin determines destination. Origin determines destination. If you do not know where you are coming from, you will not know where you are going. And if you don't know where you are going, anywhere will lead you there. It's very important to know, for us to know, what was in God's heart when he created you and me. The word purpose means the original intent of a thing. The reason of its being. And without God, life has no purpose. Without purpose, life has no meaning. Without meaning, life has no significance or hope. Hope is looking forward to something with great expectation and confidence. When we say, I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow, that is not hope. You speak into the situation. That is hope. Because Christ has done it for us. Our life is a sum total of all the decisions we make. And these decisions are governed by our priorities. And our greatest priority is to seek God in order to know the purpose of our being. You can't have a problem with your television and take it to BMW to repair for you. You have to go to God because he is our creator. The Bible says in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 29 verse 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. But those things that are revealed belong to us and our children forever. We have to keep going to him so as to get what he had in mind when he created us. Amen. I will be trying to answer two questions today. I will be trying to answer two questions today. What is God's purpose in creation? What is God's purpose in creation? And what is God's purpose in redemption? What is God's purpose in creation? And what is God's purpose in redemption? God's purpose in creation is the glory of God. God's purpose in creation is the glory of God. God's purpose in redemption is the glory of the children of God. I'm going to explain. In Romans 3, verse 23, we read, All have seen and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God's purpose for man was glory. Glory. The best expression of a thing. Glory. But sin thwarted that purpose. 
by causing man to fall short of God's glory. Sin thwarted that purpose by causing man to fall short of God's glory. When we humans, we think of sin, we instinctively think of the judgment it brings. When we think of sin, we instinctively think of the judgment it brings. We invariably associate it with condemnation and hell because I've done this. God cannot bless me. That is not true. Man's thought is always of the punishment that, he will, that will come to him if he sins. Man's thought is always of the punishment that will come to him if he sins. But God's thought is always of the glory man will miss if he sins. The result of sin is that we forfeit God's glory. The result of redemption is that we are qualified again for God's glory. So God's purpose of redemption is glory Glory, glory. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We are the glorified children of the Most High God. Let's turn our Bibles to Romans chapter 8. It's page 1134. Page 1134. Romans chapter 8 from verses 16 through to 18. Romans chapter 8, from verses 16 through to 18. If you dare say amen. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then earth. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffered with him, that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which we shall be, which shall be revealed in us. Sorry, I've got a different version. Can we go down to 29 and 30 as well, please? For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he, predest whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Our spirit and soul has already been glorified. It's all past tense. Whom he justified, this he also what glorified. We are waiting for the glorification of our body. Your spirit and soul has already been glorified. Now, if we go back to chapter 29, the Bible tells us, that he might be firstborn among many, many brethren. And I begin to wonder, what was God's objective? What was God, God's objective? 
it was that his son, Jesus Christ, might be the firstborn among many brethren, all of whom should be conformed into his image. God's objective was that his firstborn, Jesus Christ, might be the firstborn amongst many brethren, me and you, all of whom should be confirmed to his image. How did God realize that objective? How did God realize that objective? Whom he justified, them he also glorified. God's purpose in creation and redemption was to make Christ the firstborn son among many glorified sons. That may perhaps at first convey very little to many of us. Let us look into it more carefully. In John 1, 14, the Bible tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ was God's only begotten son. But God was not satisfied that Christ should remain his only begotten son. He wanted also to make him the first begotten. Amen. How could an only begotten son become the first begotten. God had one child. He wanted that child to become the first child. The only way a child can become the first child is by the father having more children. Amen. So the answer, how could an only begotten son become a first begotten? The answer is simple. By the father having more children. Amen? In the book of Genesis, chapter 8, verse 22, the Bible says, Whilst this earth remains, seed time and harvest will never cease. Seed times and harvest will never cease. It's a spiritual law and it's a physical law. The only way you can receive a harvest is by sowing a seed. Gardeners and farmers will tell you that. And in the book of John, chapter 12, verse 24, we are told that unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it produces more grain. God had a son. He wanted his only son to become the first born among many brethren. He decided to crucify his son so that he could have, he decided to sow his son so that he could have many more children and the life of his son we believe in these children, me and you. The Lord Jesus was the only begotten son. And as the only begotten son, he had no brother. But the father sent the only begotten son in order that the only begotten son might also be the first begotten and the beloved son have many Beloved brethren. There, you have the whole story of the incarnation and the cross. And there, you have at last the purpose of God fulfilled in his bringing many sons unto glory. Let's turn our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 2, verses 10 
2 to 11. That's page 1202. Hebrews 2. Ten to eleven. Can someone read that for us? I would like to hear what your your version says. If you're there, you can read please. Hebrews chapter two, verses ten through to eleven. Amen. Me and you are brothers and sisters of Christ. It may not sound very interesting, but I want you to understand this. That the same love that God has for Jesus is the same love we had it today that he has for me, for you and for me. It takes someone who knows that they are the beloved of the Most High God to overcome a Goliath. The word David means beloved. I don't know how many Goliaths you came in here with today. I don't know how many of them are in your life. But one thing I want to remind you of is that you are the beloved of the most High God. I want you to tap into that revelation to know that you are loved by God. Before Jesus started his mission, the first thing God said to him was, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That is all you know. Just focus on God's love for you and you will overcome all your Goliaths. In respect to his divinity, the Lord Jesus remains uniquely the only begotten Son of God. Yet, this sense in which from the resurrection onward and through all eternity, he is also the first begotten and his life from that time is found in many brethren. You and I, you and me, we have the life of Christ. Whether we believe it or not, we've got eternal life. The Bible says in John 17 verse 3, For this is eternal life, that you may know God. And Jesus Christ is only Son whom he sent. You see, I want you to understand this. The Christian life is not a changed life. If all what people can see in you is that what you used to do, you're not doing before, it's not satisfying. It's not satisfactory at all. The Christian life is an exchange life. It's not a changed life. Christ did not die that me and you could be good people. Christ died to give life to a dead man. We were all dead in trespasses. He died so that we could have his life. You know, I love the way Paul puts it in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Paul says, I was crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by grace in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The life we are living is his life. So we should stop trying and start trusting him. 
Because the more we acknowledge that we are dead, that we died with him, Romans 6 says, the more we allow him to live his life in us. A lot of us are struggling with bad habits, addiction. In every time we try to come up with this New Year resolution, it doesn't work. And it will never work. Maybe it could work for a couple of months. But the truth is, God wants you to come to that point of despair. Like, like Paul says, Oh, wretched man that I am, who would deliver me from this sinful body of death? And Paul was able to say in Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. It took Paul a long time to come to this point of realization that it's not about me. If we look at Romans 7, from verse 9 to 22, he used the word me, myself, and I 42 times. His focus was on him. Let our focus be on Christ. For in Jesus we have the victory. We should stop trying and start trusting. For we who are born of the Spirit are made partakers of the divine nature. It's done. It's a done deal. God has already done it. We've been made partakers of the divine nature. Do not as of ourselves, but only as we depend upon God. Do not of ourselves, but only as we depend upon God. And by virtue of our being in Christ. There is a verse in, in the scripture that I love so much. And it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. And it says, Jesus has been made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Jesus has been made unto us everything pertaining to life and godliness. There is nothing that we will ever want that God has not given us. It's all our inheritance is in Christ. So don't try to do it in isolation because it will not work. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, If anyone is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. All things have become new in Christ. I want you to live here today deeply rooted and grounded in God's love and knowing that you are the beloved of the Most High God. Meditate on God's love for you. I want you to live here knowing that you are greatly blessed, highly favored, and deeply loved by God. I want you to live here today knowing that you are the righteousness of God. The Bible says in the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 21, that for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we may become the righteousness of God. Your righteousness is not based on what you do or what you do not do. Your righteousness is based on the finished work of Christ. And he said, it is finished. There is nothing left for you to do. There is nothing that God will not complete and ask man to complete. That will not be God if we have to fight for him. I want you to know because you are the beloved of the most high God no weapon fashioned against you shall prosper 
and every thong that shall rise against you in judgment, we condemn it. I want you to know that you bear in your body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ and you cannot suffer from any form of corruption from the enemy. For when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. I want you to know that if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead indwells in you, he that raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. I want you to know that because you are the beloved of the most high God, greatly blessed, highly favored, and deeply loved, that Christ himself bore your sins in his body on the tree, that you haven't died to sin, may live for righteousness. By his stripes, you are healed. I want you to know, as a beloved of the Most High God, that he was wounded for your transgression. He was bruised for your iniquities. And the chastisement of your peace was upon him. And by his stripes, you are healed. Amen? Let us pray. Father Lord, I believe, so therefore, I speak. For this is the confidence that I have in you, that whatsoever we shall ask in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, believing, we shall receive. So therefore, I pray that we will begin to comprehend and believe the width, length, depth, and heart of our Father's unconditional love for us. We rest in our Father's love for us and not on our love for him. And may we experience victory over every fear, every sense of guilt, every addiction in our life, every illness, and every wrong doctrine. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. God bless you.